to, to join me. I'm going to be in two places today. So if you have the outline, uh, I'll be in two places today. I'll be in uh, first Peter, Second Peter 1, 2 through 4, and John 15, 15 through 16. So you can go ahead and turn there. Um, as we begin, as you're turning there, I've titled this third message, Radical Dependence. And what we see in the first, I just want to recap the first two messages, because I'm going to tie it in. Uh, the first two messages, the first one from Philippians 3, about what, what are we willing to give up to gain Christ? What are we willing to do to set aside to gain that Christ-likeness that God desires from us as the goal? And then as we looked at last week about the fact that there's nothing good in us, we need God's mercies. And we need to respond appropriately to God's mercies. And then I'll tie in John 15. Well, I'll, I'm going to hold off on John 15 for a minute. But as I think about that, I want us to think about this idea about radical dependence on something or someone because of complete inability or incompetence. Okay? Uh, the, the, the illustrations I'm going to give you relate to me. Okay? And when you hear me talk about the idea of radical dependence on something or someone because of my complete inability or incompetence, you can chuckle because it's true. When it comes to mechanical stuff, I need to radically depend on others, okay? I have basically zero mechanical, not completely. I may have 2% mechanical ability because recently I've been able to fix some small things around the house and my wife has looked at me and said, good job, Jim. <laughs> good job. So I have a couple percentage of ability, but, but most I don't. And so that's why I brought my van recently to my mechanic, because I trust him. That's radical dependence, trusting your mechanic that they're going to do the job right and that they're going to do it in a way that's fair, right? The other one that comes to mind is I think about heart surgery, if you needed radical heart surgery in here, guarantee the first person you wouldn't call to do the radical heart surgery would be me. Right? I mean, you wouldn't. Right? Now, if you needed radical heart surgery, if it came to the word of God, I might be near the top of your list. But when it comes to physical surgery, you wouldn't call me. You get the idea of this idea of radical dependence because of a, a lack of complete inability or incompetence on our part. That's where I want us to go today. And I want to read to you, um, for those who've been following along in the radical, I just want to read some quotes um, from David in chapter 3, uh, pages 45 through 50 and 56. So I'm just going to read some, some quotes that I've pulled out. And I want to contrast the idea of cultural and biblical teachings on self-reliance, when it comes to salvation, and when it comes to the, the even the more important, not, not more important, but the just as difficult part is the idea of sanctification, okay? So listen to what David says. I'm just going to highlight a few, okay? Uh, he says, for the challenge for us to live in such a way that we're radically dependent on and desperate for the power that only God can provide, Okay? Uh, and he talks about the contrast between the American church and the biblical church. He says this differenti differentiation is heightened when we contrast trust in the power of God with reliance on our own abilities. And he hits that really hard in this chapter. He says the dangerous assumption we unknowingly accept in an American dream is that our greatest asset is our own ability. You're going to see, he blows that one out of the water, and you're going to see from the message this morning that blows that out of the water as well, okay? And, and he says the problem with the American dream is thinking we can do this or you can pull yourself up by your bootstraps. He says as long as we achieve our desires in our own power, we will always attribute it to our own glory. That's the danger of being self-reliant in terms of our Christianity because then we think we've done it, and who gets the glory? Well, it's got to be me, right? And we're going to see, I believe it's next week, we're going to talk about God's glory, right, in terms of what he is able to do through us, right? 
And then David says, but the gospel and the American dream are clearly and ultimately antithetical to each other. While the goal of the American dream is to make much of us, the goal of the gospel is to make much of God. I love that statement. Okay? He says, in direct contradiction to the American dream, God actually delights in exalting, in exalting our inability. He intentionally puts his people in situations where they come face to face with their need of him. Right? Um, and I love what that, and he says, but unfortunately in the church today, we've convinced ourselves that if we can position our resources and organize our strategies, then in church, as in every other sphere of life, we can accomplish anything we set our minds to. That's a lie from the pit of hell. But what is strangely lacking in the picture of performances, personalities, programs, and professionals is the desperate desperation for the power of God. See, if churches, and we can do this on our own, then we don't desperately need God, right? And I've been, I've been saying this for years, that we need to be desperate and dependent on God from the beginning of salvation through the end of salvation, which is going to be culminated in glory, right? Um, I, I, I just, he just says some just powerful things, Right? Um, he says, a, a scene where we no longer settle for what we can do in our own power. A scene where the church radically trusts in God's gate power to provide unlikely people with unlimited, unforeseen, uninhibited resources to make his name known as great. And then jumping over to 56, he said, God delights in using ordinary Christians who come to the end of themselves and choose to trust in his extraordinary provision. He stands ready to allocate his power to all who are radically dependent on him and radically devoted to making much of him. Would you agree with that, church? The problem is, much of the church is incompetent today because it's resting in its own power. We need to get back to radical dependence on God. And I can tell you from my own personal journey, sanctification-wise, there is no way you would see me personally sanctified the way I am if it was resting on my own energies and abilities. The only reason I look anything like I do and anything like Jesus is because his radical, radical power in my life. And you know what, church? Church? We're seeing God's radical power in our midst, maybe not in great ways like we might see in you know, other churches and what God's doing, but I'm telling you what, I look around and I look at the people God is bringing into this church right now, positioning us for something I believe really incredible, what God wants to do in our midst, not because of our wonderful website. It's pitiful, folks. It's pitiful. But God is using our pitiful web fight to draw people in for his glory. Do you believe that, church, this morning? Amen. Right? And then if you look at Scripture, you look at the example of Scriptures, where there were things that only the Lord could do. And here's just four examples. Joshua in the Battle of Jericho. Are you kidding me? You're going to defeat a powerhouse? Jericho? With a bunch of horn-blowing trumpets? Really? What about Gideon? Starts out with 30,000 men, ends up with guys lapping out of the river, 300 men that they don't even have to fight. They just smash their, 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 their lanterns and God defeats them. Jehoshaphat, I was just reading about Jehoshaphat in Chronicles recently. Where the, where the enemy comes against him and is taunting him and mocking him and says, your God can't do anything. And he depends on the Lord in prayer. And God says, you don't even have to worry. They're not even, you're not even going to have to fight. The enemies that come against him fight against each other and they all run away. Right? That's God. Samson. The power that he had, that God gave him, he could do and he couldn't do it on his own. Isaiah 55, 8, if you're writing verses down, God says, I can do immeasurably more than you ask or imagine. I, I, can, I can do things that you don't understand, Isaiah 58. My ways are not your ways, right? And so if that's the case, why are we tending to rely on ourselves? If we have such a wonderful God, why are we depending on ourselves? Okay, so I want us to look at 
What is true about our reliance, this radical reliance on God? I want to take us, first of all, to first, or, yeah, first, Second Peter 1. I've preached this before, but I want to preach it in the context of this idea of radical dependence. So 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. What I, want us to, what I want to do in these two scriptures is I want to show that all of this that Peter and, jo- and Jesus talk about in these two scriptures this morning all highlight that this is God's work, not ours. To get our eyes off ourselves and get them onto God. Okay? So let's, first of all, I want us to look at his power for his work in us in 2 Peter, and then I'm going to look at his, his provision for his work through us. Because if you think about it, God has to do a work in us before he can do a work through us. Would you agree, church? He must. Because if that work is not happening in us, he cannot do anything through us. Right? So he's going to start with his work in us, his, his powerful work in us. And I gave you a side scripture, Ephesians 1, 19 and 20, that you can go look at that it's, it's similar to Peter in terms of God's power working in us, okay? So let's look at 2 Peter 1, 2 through 4. Paul, Peter says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Wow. This power working in us. What does it look like? Well, first of all, he says his grace and peace are multiplied in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ. And he's talking there about grace and peace being the beginning of salvation, right? And I I always wondered why these writers always started their letters with grace and peace. See, I used to think it was kind of a tack on until I understood the nature of grace and peace. What he's saying to them is is, as Peter and Paul and others begin their letters with grace and peace, he's talking about that's the beginning of salvation, It's grace that brings us to Christ. It is God's incredible, undeserved, unearned, unmerited favor that is a gift that brings us into that salvation. And it's then and only then that we can have the peace between us and God that Christ can bring through faith in him. So that's where it starts, right? But then there's so there's saving grace and saving peace, but there's enabling grace and enabling peace. If we are going to live this life that God has called us to apart from the world, right? And the, by the way, the greatest enemy in this fight of sanctification is not the world. It's not the devil. It's us. We're our greatest enemies. We need God's enabling grace. We need God's enabling, multiplying peace in our lives every single day. So if you have stopped relying on God's grace and peace at salvation, you are doing yourself an incredible disservice because we need that enabling grace and enabling peace all the time. And so what really, what really Peter is saying here is without the knowledge of God in Jesus Christ, not not an intellectual knowledge necessarily, but an experiential knowledge of a relationship with them that grows through his word, right? That's how grace and peace are multiplied in our lives every day. And you say, well, give me a quick illustration, Pastor. You know, the the more that I have really become dependent on the Lord in the last probably year or two, I've understood his grace and peace in ways that I've never understood it before. Church, I've been saved for 37 years. Church, I have been pastoring for 30 years, but it's probably within the last year or two that God has really helped me to understand his grace and peace in my life through the knowledge of him and his son in his word, by his spirit. Peace. I have peace 
beyond measure. I've had circumstances recently to come against my peace, to come against, to create anxiety and fear. And, and every time I go back to God and I say, God, if I'm going to face what I'm facing right now, you have to give me your incredible peace that passes all understanding. Philippians chapter four, verses four through seven. And you know what? My God hasn't disappointed me once recently. He hasn't disappointed me at all. But he's given me the peace and the grace that I've been able to need to walk in that. And it's been multiplied in my life. And he says, really, what Peter's saying is without the knowledge of God in Jesus Christ, we have no understanding of grace. We have no peace, let alone multiplied grace and peace. And you go back to Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Where by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not of your own works, right? Kind of that whole idea of, you know, no self-reliance there. You can't boast because you didn't do anything to earn it. And then in Romans 5, 1 and 2, grace and peace are actually put together because we have been justified. We now have peace with God and we stand in God's grace for all eternity. That's what he's talking about. We are positioned in God's peace and God's grace. And it's being multiplied through the knowledge of him each and every day of our life. Notice there's no mention there about us. It's all about him. Right? And, and I guess you have to excuse the rant for a minute. I'm going to rant to you, but I'm ranting to the church out there. So many today are preaching messages from this sacred pulpit who've been entrusted to bring the message of God's word and they're preaching this idea of self-reliance and you can do it. Shame on them. They're going to have to stand before the God of the universe who's entrusted them with the gospel of God when they are lying and deceiving their people, telling them that it's all about you. No, it's not, church. It's about Jesus Christ. And the only thing about us is that we got chosen to be part of his plan and that he's going to work through us. That's it. That's it. We are chosen vessels. We are vessels of mercy. We, are, we should be grateful that God wants to do anything with this. Right? Because if I were God, thank God I'm not, I would have thrown me away a long time ago and said, that's a piece of trash that can't even be used. But because of God's incredible grace, mercy, and peace in my life, I'm looking at what God's doing in my life right now, and I'm blown away. I'm blown away. I got to tell you, I had a dear brother in Christ, 67 years of age, recently. He and his wife, Steve and Susan, just absolutely loved Jesus with all their heart. I met him at Precept years ago. He was a trained Precept leader. He, was, he does exactly what I do, do with the same incredible passion and same incredible knowledge that your pastor has. And he just went to be with Jesus. And, and I was just blown away at the service as I was watching it the other night. I was just blown away at how God is, was using Steve Butler for his kingdom. And in that moment, that moment when I want to play pity party and say, well, what are you using me for? God said, you know what, Jim, I'm using you in a, just as powerful way as I'm using Steve Butler. Why? Because you're willing vessels for me. It's all because of grace, mercy, and peace. And you know what? He wants to do the same thing for each one of you. He wants to use you, but you've got to have the knowledge of him, that grace and mercy multiplied in your life, Right? And then he goes on to say, his divine power has granted us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. Now, I want you to notice, I underlined, I underlined the word granted and everything. He has granted to us. Okay, This is God's work, not ours. He has granted. He is, he's given it out of grace. The word granted comes from the word grace. The word granted is something that I, I grant you this favor. It's not something you deserve. It's something I'm going to grant you out of my authority. And what God is saying, what Peter is saying here is God is giving us out of his grace this. The only reason we have any of this that he's talking about, everything pertaining to life and godliness, is because God granted it to us as a gift. We didn't earn it. We didn't deserve it. It's not our power. It's all his. You get it, church? You understand my passion this morning? Got to get out of our self-reliance and start depending on the Lord completely, right? 
So his divine power, his almighty energy. You know, as I was looking up the word almighty energy, God's almighty energy. Think about places in scripture where God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have used their almighty energy to bring things about. Well, guys, the first place I went to was creation. Hello? Hello? He opened his mouth and light came out of his mouth at 186,000 feet per second? Hello? That's pretty almighty energy, right? Now, I believe it was Jesus that opened his mouth and all of that stuff came into being. Then there's the resurrection, right? God's power in the resurrection, raising a dead body to life that's never been able to be done apart from the power of God. That almighty energy, by the way, the way God has worked, and you can, go, you can see his almighty energy all over the pages of Scripture, right? Everywhere. You know where that energy dwells? It dwells within us by the power of the Holy Spirit. His divine energy. He is granted by his power. He, you are privileged to have his divine power in your life if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus. Do you know that? Don't take it for granted. Don't assume you deserve it. Say thank you, thank you, thank you for that divine energy every day because it's his that he's granted to us as a favor why? Because he's granted us everything, everything, everything. Can I say it well? Everything. By the way, what do you think the word everything means in Greek? It means everything. Everything. Not some. Everything has been put inside of us pertaining to, related to life and godliness. Anything that we would need as believers to live out his life and to live in a godly way before God and others has been put in us as a resource to tap into so that we have no excuses for our sin. We have no reason to say, well, I couldn't help it. And, I, and I heard, I've heard people say this, well, you know, Jesus could do it because he was God. But you know, the more I've come to understand the hypostatic union, the relationship between the man part and the God part of God, of Jesus. The more I realize that most of what he did in terms of miracles, I believe was based on the power of the Holy Spirit as he surrendered to it at, from, as a man. It wasn't his God power that did it. It was his dependence on the Holy Spirit. And I believe he did that as an example for us to know that we can live the same way that he lived if we will depend on the Spirit the way he depended on the Spirit for the things that he did. Right? That same power that Jesus had at his disposal in his earthly form, we have as our power, it's in us to live in a way that is pleasing to God, both inwardly and outwardly. Everything. And he says, how? Through the true knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and excellence. Through the true knowledge of him, the true knowledge of him experientially, but also through his word, who has called us, the word called there is relation to salvation, by his own glory and excellence. Uh, notice he doesn't say he called us because we were good. Called us into salvation by his own glory, his honor, who he is, and his excellence, moral excellencies. It was all because of him. Let, let me ask you a question right here just for a second. Where in here do you see anything about our power? Nowhere, right? It's all about his power being granted to us, which means if you look at this text carefully, it means basically we can do what we need to do to live this life in a godly way with nothing pertaining to our own means, none of our own power. And then he goes on to say, and, and, and again, I wrote myself this note this morning. I wrote it and I ended it with an exclamation point absolutely no self-reliance. None. All him. And you heard me pray earlier. What happens when we get into self-reliance? Do things go well for us or not so well for us when we, when we stop trusting God, we stop depending on him, we stop relying on him, no matter what our circumstance? How do things go for us usually? They go south, don't they? 
And I can't speak to your life, but I can speak to my own. When I stop relying on God and his power to do what he needs to do, even inwardly, and giving me peace that I need, things go really south for me. And they go south quickly, don't they, family? But when the Holy Spirit is at the center of my life and I am relying on him, it's amazing what God does through this life. It says, by these... He has granted by these to us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them, by them, not inherent in us, but by these magnificent and precious promises. Again, he's given that out of his grace so that we might what? We might become partakers of the divine nature. Now, watch this. This is not, this is not new age. This is not pantheism where where people believe you, everything has a divine nature in it, like the tree and all that kind of stuff, where, where, God, where we are made out to be gods. This is not what he's talking about. What he's saying is by the privilege of being in relationship with him and having the true knowledge of him, we now have the ability to look more like God, to have within us the divine nature that allows us to live this life in godliness for his, for his glory, and we're going to talk about that more next week, for his glory, right? That we can be partakers of the divine nature. And then he says, having escaped the corruption that's in the world by lust. So it is his divine nature in us that makes us more and more like him progressively to be more and more like God and look more and more like Jesus, right? Allows us, we've already escaped the lusts. Uh, the corruption, right? The corruption that was in us before, that's being taken over by this power within us to allow us to become partakers. And we know it's progressive. We know that sanctification is a process. Would I, would I get any amens on that? It's a process. Has anybody arrived here today in terms of their sanctification? Good, because I haven't either. We're on the same journey, right? We're, we are. We are. We're, we, and it's, it, it, the battle gets tough sometimes, right? And I want to give you just some, some quick scriptures. Romans 8, 29. So I just want you to write them down. I'm not going to necessarily go there. Romans 8, 29 talks about being in the image of Christ, being transformed into the image of Christ. 2 Corinthians 3, 18 talks about being transformed from glory to glory. Colossians 3, 10 talks about being recreated so we can now bear the image that we should have borne, that we did bear, through Adam in the garden, but now we're recreated into the image of God. And then 1 Corinthians 15, 49 is in the resurrection chapter talking about us bearing his image. 1 John 3, 2 as well talks about when he appears, we will be like him, right? We'll be like him. We'll understand who we are in our fullness because we will be like him. We'll be transformed ultimately into his glory. So our ability to partake in the divine nature is a gift, which means we are helpless on our own. Are you getting the, you getting the point through 1 Peter that none of this is us? It's all him, right? Right? Now, let's look at the second scripture in John 15. Let's go to John 15. And so once, once he's able to do his work in us, or as he's doing his work in us, then he can do his work through us. And I want to show you, I, I didn't read this scripture up front, but, wrote, but, but John 15, 5 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do what? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. We can bear no spiritual fruit that looks like Jesus or that has lasting implications apart from an abiding relationship with Christ. And it starts at the cross. But it continues with an increased abiding in him daily. Let me ask you a question, church. I, I, don't, I don't mean to get offensive, but I want to ask you a challenging question that you need to take up with the Lord himself. Don't answer it to me. Answer it to the Lord. Go and ask the Lord this, because he's going to give you a totally different answer than I might give you or that you might lie to yourself about in your spirit. Am I abiding intimately with Jesus Christ on a daily basis? Ask the Lord that. Ask him to show you. Are you abiding? Am I abiding with you, Lord, in an intimate relationship with you? 
Am I completely reliant on you? Am I completely dependent on you for everything in my life each and every day? Let the Lord answer that and deal with it. Because you know what? I could say something and you would probably get mad at me. But if you're honest before the Lord, you're not going to get mad at him when he points out that you're not abiding with him. But here's the good news. He will, he will gently and lovingly show you how to get in that intimate and ongoing relationship with him. That is so crucial for the days in which we live. Okay? So I want us to look at John 15, 15 to 16. I want to look at his provision for his work through us. And, and I'm, I'm just going to say this. I'll say, you probably heard me say it before. The first time I said it at the church in Michigan, I think somebody thought I was a heretic. But I said, listen to me carefully. I, I made this statement years ago, and I continue to, to convict, convictingly say this. Jesus' Jesus's primary reason for saving us was not to bring us to heaven. Okay, stop and let that one sink in for a minute. Because when you first hear it, it sounds heretical. Like, what do you mean he didn't bring? Just listen to me for a minute. Because if he saved us and his primary goal was just to take us to heaven to be with him, then why in the world did he leave us here in this world? See, I don't believe that the number one primary reason for Jesus saving us is he saved us so he could use us here to bring others to salvation as he works through us. Yes, the ultimate reality is because of that, God will bring us to dwell with him forever. But what a cruel joke if God saved us to bring us to heaven and he left us here in this world, in this fleshly body for 37 plus years. God saved us because he wants to use us. He wants to use us in a way that he used Lisa and my dear brother in Christ, Randy Boardman, to show me who Jesus was. As God was working in their lives, I got a glimpse of what it looked like to, to follow the true God as I watched their lives. And it was what God used to bring me to Christ. Maybe he's done that for you. Maybe he used somebody in your life as God was working in their life to work through them to bring you to that place where you know who the true God is. Right? That's, by the way, for those who have, and I don't like the word self-esteem because I don't believe it's biblical, but for those of you who might be having spiritual confidence issues in terms of the fact that you don't think God wants to use you, I'm here to put that to rest today. If you're saved and you're genuinely saved, God not only wants to, but he can, and he, and he desires to use you in mighty ways. So don't let Satan sell you the lie that you're not important. Right? Because he saves us so he can use us in, in amazing ways. Okay? So let's look at his provision. In 15 and 16, Jesus is talking to disciples, right? And he says, No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave doesn't know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that fruit would remain so that whatever you ask in, of the Father in my name may be given to you. Right? <laughs> what I want us to see is he makes known to us all things that he's heard from the Father. Right? And he does it. And we have, we have something that the early apostles didn't have. We have the completed word of God. They didn't have it. They had complete dependence on the Holy Spirit. Matter of fact, these guys were the ones that were going to end up writing the scripture. But we have their completed work in front of us. So he makes known to us through the Holy Spirit, by his word, the things that, we, that he's heard from the Father. He gives it to us as a gift. Right? And so earlier I talked about the fact that he, he makes available to us his power working in us. Here we see that we have the things that we need to know that he grants to us as a gift. And without making it known, we would know nothing and need to be completely dependent on him. And I, and I wrote this note just on Wednesday last week. With him... We know everything we need for his work. Think about that. With him, 
in his word as he disclosed, disclosed it to us. We have everything we need to do his work. We know what we need. We're equipped, right? We don't have to go looking to outside sources. We have God's word if we will study it to know what has been revealed to us by the Father so that we can do the work that he's calling us to do. I love that. He, he made it known to the early apostles, and as it's been passed on through his word, we now have the evidence of what God was doing through them. And, and, and in so many ways, the apostle Paul, even after the early apostles, Paul, we have three quarters of the New Testament written by him. We know what we need to know to do his work. Aren't you grateful? Can you imagine if somebody said, here's a job I want you to do. Go for it. You don't have any tools. And I'm not going to give you an instruction manual. I'm not going to show you how to do it. Right? Thank God for women. Women read instructions. Men don't. Maybe that's why women are so much more into the word of God these days in, in churches than men are. Because they think they can go it alone. But when it comes to this instruction manual... Men, we're supposed to be the head. We're supposed to be the leaders who are instructing our families in the way of God to be able to carry out his work, not only individually, but in our families and in our church, right? So I, with him, we have everything we need to know for his work. But look at what he goes on to say. I, you didn't choose me. Boy, does that sound, does that sound like anti-self-reliance? You didn't pick me. You weren't walking down the street one day and said, I think I'll follow Jesus and carry on his work in the kingdom after he's gone. No, 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 no. You guys, let me remind you, you guys were fishing. And not only that, after the resurrection, you kind of got a little bummed out and you went back to fishing. This wasn't about you at all. I chose you. And by extension, by application today, church, we were chosen by the Lord Jesus Christ for his work before the beginning of time, according to Ephesians 1. You are special. Do you understand that today? If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are special. You belong to him. He's chosen you. Now I'm challenging us from the pulpit to be radical for Jesus so that people can see it in our lives and in this church. He says, I chose you and appointed you to be my disciples, to be my followers, so that you would bear fruit that remains. There you go. He doesn't say, I chose you, I saved you, and when I go to heaven, you're going with me. Uh-uh. I'm leaving you here, boys. I'm leaving you here. I chose you and appointed you to go bear fruit. And oh, by the way, side note in Matthew 10 is, you're going to go through a lot of suffering for my sake. And the Apostle Paul, the very one that was fighting against God, I love that radical conversion experience on the road to Damascus. This voice shows up and says, why are you persecuting me? He says, who are you, Lord, that I'm persecuting you? What he's saying is, you're persecuting my people. You're persecuting me. The Lord Jesus Christ showed up and says, oh, by the way, I'm picking you. You're going to, and then you're going go to you're gonna go to this guy on Straight Street by the name of Ananias, and he's going to give you marching orders. And you're going to go, and Ananias is like a little nervous because like, isn't this guy killing us? Would I, would I welcome this guy into my home? He's been killing us. Are you sure, Lord? The Lord reassures him, and he gives him his marching orders. He says, by the way, you're going to be a preacher to the Gentiles, and you're going to suffer so much for my name's sake. And I look at the Apostle Paul, the great Apostle Paul, and go, chosen and appointed to bear fruit for God, for Jesus. Didn't start out that way. But look at what God did through Paul. Look at what God does through all the believers that he has chosen to do his work. And he says, I says I've chosen you. And have appointed you, not to bring you to heaven, but appointed you to go bear fruit. And fruit that remains, that will be perpetual, that will be ongoing. That will not be just a, a little bit of fruit, right? But it's like, it's like the fruit tree that perpetually bears fruit in my yard every year, right? Or the lilacs. I love the lilacs. I, God was so gracious to give us the, the house that he gave us in, on North Morrison Street. Do you know my favorite flower growing up was? Was lilacs. We had lilacs next to my grandma's house. When I see lilacs, I think back to grandma. 
I think back to grandma. She's been gone for 30 something years. I, even, no, 45. And I think back, I think back to grandma. I, I look and I go, I know that tree is gonna bear that fruit of the lilacs. And I look out there, and that's what it's talking about, that perpetual fruit, that fruit. And what is the fruit, John 15? The fruit of abiding in the vine is fruit that is the, is the image of Jesus. Because how God can use us is when we start to look more and more and more like Jesus. And we start proclaiming that what the gospel, we, we, we argue the gospel can do, which is what? Transform a life. It actually does. <laughs> it's one thing to get out there and say, well, you know, you need Jesus because God needs to radically transform your life. But look at me, I'm a pitiful bearing fruit tree. No, no. I'm here to declare you the truth that God can transform a life and change you. And I'm here to testify personally to the fact that God has done that and he's doing that as I'm continuing to bear ongoing fruit. That's how God can use us as we are radically dependent on him. We can do nothing, 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 nothing to bear fruit except be responsive to what God's doing and bearing fruit that remains. So my question would be, should we be dependent or independent on him? Should we be dependent or independent? If he's that incredible and he can do what we can't do, should we be dependent on him? Absolutely. How much? A little? How about radically? How about 100%? How about... 200% dependent on what he can do. And if you're looking at the life that's being produced here, uh, that fruit being the life of the vine, here's, what I, here's the conclusion I came to just the other day as I was re-preparing this. You can't separate your life from your ministry. You can't separate what God is doing in your life from the ministry God has given you. They go hand in hand together. And then look at finally what he says. He says in verse 16, if you do that, or this is the process, so whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give you. He will grant you or give you whatever you ask in his name. This isn't talking about, Lord, I need a Porsche today. Okay, congregation. God's laid in my heart, I need a $6 million jet so I can fly back to Indiana and visit my friends. Come on. You know what I'm talking about? That foolishness, Creflo dollar? No, 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 no. It's not talking about that. Whatever you ask in my name, right, would be according to his, his reputation, his character, right? And in the context of John 15, it's not just to ask for just anything. It's to ask what we need that's going to cause us to bear fruit. Let me ask you a question. Where's your fruit shortage? Where's the fruit shortage in your walk with the Lord? What fruit are you short on based on Galatians 5? What's short? Short on patience? Short on love? Short on peace? Right? What are the character qualities of God that you're short on? Because guess what you need to be asking for? If you're short on peace, guess what? Ask for peace. Lord, that's the only way I can be used effectively. If you're short on patience, right? Or you're short on love. I know that's where I fall short. I can stand with the best of them and declare against sin all day. But can I do it in a loving way that's going to draw people to the gospel, not push them away? What do we need in our life to be able to bear fruit? And here's, here's what. He gives whatever we ask in his name for the purpose of bearing fruit for him. So it's not asking selfishly, it's asking for him because only he can bear the fruit. And this is, the, I, I wrote myself a little, this is cool. it's, it's almost like a, a circle. So if you start up here, we ask, we bear fruit, we ask, we bear fruit, it's a cycle. So as we ask for the fruit that we need to do ministry, Right? We can bear the fruit, and then we keep asking. We keep bearing. It's a cycle, church. It's an absolute cycle. So as we close it out this morning, 
Let me ask this question. Did, did you get the idea of the, the title of the message, Radical Dependence? Did, 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 I, did, I, did I say it enough to say that we are radically, 100% dependent on Jesus Christ for everything? Did you walk away with that today? Okay, good, then I've done my job. But here's the reality. David talks about it in the book. He talks about the idea that God exalts our inability. He loves our inability because in our inability, God can do some incredible things. If we think we got this one, then God's not going to show off and show, show up and show off, right? But our inability becomes his ability if we let it be the vessel. What do we realize that we can't do at all, but he can do completely? Where are we lacking? He can do it completely if you let him. What are we trying to do that only he can do, and why are we trying to do it on our own? What have we not asked for and gotten because we believed we didn't need it from him because we thought we could do it on our own? Challenging, right? And this is actually a message I could preach every week. It wouldn't get old because we need to be reminded of this constantly, don't we, church? How many, let me ask you just a question real, real quickly. How many of you are willing to be honest enough today to say that there are times in your life when even as a Christian, you, you get into the, a self-reliance mode, like I'm, I can do this one. The danger for me is, you know what? God has so gifted me to teach God's word, I don't even have to study at this point. I know God's word well enough, I could fly by the seat of my pants. Danger, 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 right? Mm-mm. I don't care how well I know God's word. I constantly need, because you know what? He's showing me new things every day. And you know what? Until I can actually live it out perfectly, I don't really get it. Because the, the getting it is living it out the way I'm supposed to. I can know it, but if I'm not living it, then I haven't gotten it. I want to end us on this. As we get ready to sing, I want to end us on this beautiful scripture, which I think is just a great way to end this message. And, and church, I pray that this would be our prayer individually as well as corporately in this church. Paul says in Ephesians 3, 20 and 21, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all we ask or think according to the power that works where within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. And God's people said.